Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Briefly, we'll have a message from Congressman Lou Correa for the webinar. Hi there, I'm your Congressman Luis Correa. Want to take a few moments of your time to talk about school loans. I want to talk about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, Loan Forgiveness Opportunity. If you're a government employee, if you're a teacher, if you're a civic servant, if you're in the military and you owe a school loan, you may have some or part of it forgiven. The deadline to apply, October 31st, Halloween night. Let's get that application in. Today, in this webinar, we'll talk a little bit about the fine points of the program. And if you still have any questions, please call our office, 714-559-6190. Again, your Congressman Luis Correa at 714-559-6190. 9-0. Thank you, and let's get it done. Thank you, Congressman, for your message, and now we'll begin the presentation. Hello, and welcome to Congressman Lou Correa's Public Service Loan Forgiveness Webinar Town Hall. We have Isaiah Elias from the Department of Education here to do a presentation on how to fill out the Public Service Loan Forgiveness form. So, Elias, I'm going to hand it off to you, and let you get started. Awesome. And thank you, Congressman, for affording us the opportunity to be here today. We are really excited about covering information on how, you, how to navigate filling out the public service loan forgiveness form. A lot of times during this webinar, you're going to hear me speaking acronyms such as the PSLF, that just simply uh, short for public service loan forgiveness. If I start to talk about the PE PSLF, that's a temporarily expanded public service loan forgiveness. So as I sort of speak to these acronyms, among others, I'll try my best to explain what those acronyms are so we are all on the same page. With that said, let's cover what we're also going to talk about within this webinar. We're going to cover the basics because we do have a limited waiver, which sunsets or concludes on October 31st, 2021, which means that we are less than four, and four weeks away to the conclusion of the limited waiver, which we'll also cover in this presentation as well. I'll get into how to apply for PSLF, and then we're gonna run several scenarios and several myths that you may have heard while you're out and about in your communities. And then we're gonna touch on some tools and resources that we think will be best, will be best helpful to you as you're sort of navigating what can seem to be confusing in this complicated process. So with that said, let's jump on to jump into what are the basics. Now, prior to the limited waiver even coming about, there was, there's a program called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And on your screen is just a description of the basics, such as you have to have 120 payments. While you're making these qualifying payments, you need to be working full time for a qualifying employer. And all in, in, inclusive of that is that the payment that you made, the payments that you're making these payments on, the repayment plan, has to be a qualifying repayment plan program, which in this sense is a direct loan program. So that does matter. And that's gonna come into play for other loan programs that we do have. But before anything changes, these are the basics. Again, I'm gonna, reset, I'm gonna repeat it. It's 120 qualifying payments. Why on a direct loan program? Why are you working for a qualifying employer? And don't worry. If you're wondering if your employer is a qualifying employer, we do have a way for you to check to see whether or not they are qualifying. And all in this process, you need to be have a private submitted your application, or you are being in the process of reviewing it or receiving public service loan forgiveness. You need to fulfill all of these other requirements. Now, when it comes to the remaining forgiven amount, let's say you you, you made for your 120 qualifying payments, you were working for a qualifying employer and then you know, the repayment plan that you had was an eligible repayment plan. And we said you are eligible for it to have your remaining balance forgiven. On a federal level, the remaining balance is not tax deductible. So you won't be, you won't be penalized for this forgiven amount. It may vary from state to state in regard to state income tax, but from a federal level, we, we, you, the remaining balance is not tax, is not considered taxable 
income. A little also note, just on this screen that you see before you, the 120 payments do not need to be consecutive. They can be separated between a number of years, if it's in bulk, if it's on and off, they can be considered on and off as long as they all add up to 120 qualifying payments. But again, they do not need to be consecutive. That's one myth uh, buster right there. So last year, a couple of years ago, we expanded on the basics, right? We just laid the foundation for what the PSLF basics was, but we wanted to expand it out to meet the needs of people where they are. So during this limited time, if you are making payments regardless of the repayment plan, remember before as it pertains to the basics, it had to be under a direct loan program, under an income-driven repayment plan, a standard repayment option, that was the basics, but on for this particular time, up until the 31st of October, no matter the loan program that you have making payments on, you will get credit for those payments made on that direct loan program. So let's say, for example, if before you had a Fells loan, which is the Federal Family Educational Loan or a Perkins loan, what you would do at that at that time in order to get credit for payments made on those loans, you would have to consolidate those loans into a direct loan program. And then we will also count the payments that were made in previous years for, for those particular loan programs. But what it remains consistent is that you have to be full-time. You have to be working for a qualifying employer while you are, you are eligible to make these payments or when prior payments were being made. Now, during this particular time right now, there is a payment pause uh, for it affecting a lot of individuals. Now, during this particular time of the pay payment pause, these payments are being counted, although you're not making or required to make payments during this particular time. So in essence, you're being counted for the non-payments. You're not being penalized for it, you just don't have to make payments in order for that payment to be to be counted. Also keep in mind as well as it pertains to that. If you have a Fells loan or a Perkins loan, those payments are not part of the payment pause and therefore they won't be counted. In order for them to be counted, you must consolidate into a direct loan program. And you must do so on or before October 31st of 2022, which in this case is approximately 27 days away. A couple of different buckets that we consider individuals in. Let's say, for example, if you are an individual that only di borrowed direct loans. Oh, let me just take a step back just for a moment, because many individuals don't know how to even check to see whether or not they have a direct loan program. They have a, a called a Fell or a Perkins loan. Ways to check is simply visit studentaid.gov. When you get to that location in the upper right hand corner, you're going to see a little person's icon or infographic. You want to make sure that you are clicking on that individual and then you're going to log in with your FSA ID and password. Don't worry if you don't remember it. You can always retrieve your username and password by just following the steps located below the field. Now, if you do, when you do are able to log in, you're going to scroll down to where you see loan details. Then you'll be able to see a breakdown of whether or not you have drug direct loans or not. Now, if you do, all you simply need to do is go through the PSLF help tool, which we'll get into in a little bit. Then you'll also navigate, have that information populated on a PDF form. And if Mohila is your servicer, you can upload that through their system. If they're not, then you wanna make sure that your facts are mailed in to us. That's if you already have direct loans. Now, if you're previously consolidated into direct loans, just simply, again, you're just going to go in and you'll go ahead and go through the process, have everything populated on, on the form, have what we call an EC. The EC is just simply employment certification. Then what you do is take that, send it off to your employer. They're just going to certify when, in fact, your hire date and if you left the job, whether or not that you, you are a, a termination date or if you're still working there or not. And they'll go ahead and check this out. You get that back, you put it with the packet, and then you go ahead and send it in. Now, if you still have Fell loans or a Perkins loan, whether or not you are, that's in combination with your direct loans or just by themselves, you want to make sure that you're consolidating all of those loans in order to get credit for past payments, whether or not they were part of the payment pause. So in order to do so, you need to consolidate those loans because you can't be eligible for PSLF 
simply by putting forth and trying to get credit or an application to get credit for the fell loans a person was in their current state. They would need to be consolidated in order to get credit for those as well. So those are the three borrower groups as it pertains to being eligible and what kind of loans eligibility as it pertains to public service loan forgiveness or the PSLF program. Now on your screen right now is, is a chart as to saying what's the difference between the normal PSLF requirement basics and then what's the what's different with the limited waiver. For example, under normal circumstances, we were only looking at direct loans. However, for this limited period of time, you can get credit for regardless the loan program, but you have to consolidate those into a direct loan program. So even if that was a fell loan, even if it was a Perkins loan, you can still get credit for past periods of repayment, just as long as you consolidate those into a direct loan program. Now, under normal circumstances, as it pertains to the type of repayment plan, and you have to have a standard repayment plan that's listed under an IDR. IDR stands for Income Driven Repayment Plan. Now, for these normal next 27 days, past payments under any plan will count. So if it, even if it's pay as you earn, graduated, any of those repayment plan types, those will qualify during this period of time as well. Now, before, all the payments needed to be made on time under the normal PSLF requirement. Now, that means if you are oh, if you are due one hundred dollars for over the, the next twelve months, you would need to see be, be uh, collected with in terms of information that you have made that one hundred dollar payment each of the twelve months. Now, under the normal that's under normal uh, requirements. Now, under this limited time, we're going to count all payments regardless if they were made in full or made in half or if they, even if they were made on time. We're counting all payments. Okay, and lastly. You've under the normal requirements, you can only receive forgiveness while you're working for a qualifying employer at the time of application and forgiveness. Now, under the, for this limited time, you do not have to be employed by a qualifying employer in order to get credit for those payments or receive forgiveness. So those are the primarily the four distinct differences between what's, re, what's the regular normal PSLF requirements and the limited time, limited waiver. Keep this in mind, the PSLF limited waiver will conclude on October 31st, 2022, and then everything will be reverted back to the normal requirements as it pertains to public service loan forgiveness. Now, a couple of different things, as we talk about eligible loan types, we speak of the subsidized, we speak of the unsubsidized, we speak of grad plus loan. Those are the loans that are eligible for the public service loan forgiveness. The loans that are not eligible by themselves, un unconsolidated, are the FELL loan, which is the Federal Family Educational Loan, as well as the Federal Perkins Loan. You have to consolidate these into a direct loan program in order to get credit for past payments, as well as for them to be part of the payment pause count. And another way if you do that is to consolidate those loans. Just a note on the Parent PLUS loans. The Parent PLUS loans by themselves do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness simply because they're not eligible for the IDR or the Income Driven Repayment Plans. Now, because they're not eligible for that, that, for that repayment plan under the normal PSLF requirements, they do not qualify. Even on the limited waiver, in order for these payments to be to counted, they have to be consolidated with other eligible loan types, such as your unsubsidized, your subsidized, your grad plus loan. If they're consolidated into a direct loan program, then those payment counts will start counting at this particular time. If you're trying to roll them into one another, they won't count because again, they're not eligible for the IDR plan, which is a requirement under normal, normal circumstances as it pertains to the public service loan forgiveness program. Now, just to recap, if you want to take advantage of the of the PSLF uh, limited waiver, what you're going to do is visit studentaid.gov forward slash PSLF or forward slash PSLF help tool. When you get to the help tool, then you're going to be asked to enter what's called the employer, employer identification number that, or also known as the EIN. You can also find that on, on box B on your W-2s. Now, when you get to your, when you, when you find your EIN number, you're going to put that into the help tool and it's going to identify 
whether or not your employer is a qualifying employer. If they are, it's going to ask you to input dates of hire, dates of termination, or if you're still, in fact, employed at that employer. When you, when you put all that information on there, then you're going to also print, going to print out the employment certification or the EC. You're going to send that into your benefits department or your HR department or whoever is handling certifying the employment for your sales support employees. Once you get that completed and get that back, then if Mohila is your loan servicer, you're going to go ahead and put the packet together and send it off to Mohila. If Mohila is not your loan servicer, then you're simply going to eat, going to fax it to us or mail it into us. Keep this in mind as it pertains to submitting your, your, your loan application. Typically want to wait until if you have until you get notification that your loans have been consolidated. If in fact you had to consolidate your loans because you are a fell recipient or Perkins Vara, or you had you had plus loans that you wanted to roll into other other um, loan types and consolidate it all in one. At the conclusion of that consolidation, then you want to make sure you put forth that application into it so we can start making um, collecting information on your payment account. And you want to make sure you submit to us your PSL form on or before October 31st, 2022. So let's navigate on applying for the applying for the PSLF. Number one, when you when you're putting in the application, we're going to evaluate you for two different types of programs. Number one, the regular public service loan forgiveness or during this time, the limited waiver. The second will be the temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness. Now, the TEPSLF is where if you're going through the normal process of PSLF and then we deem you not eligible only due to the repayment plan, then you will be evaluated for the TEPSLF, the Temporary Expanded Public Service Loan Forgiveness, and then we'll make sure that we, if you are eligible, we'll forgive those, we can forgive, we'll forgive those loans as well, as long as funds are available. So that's when we look, when we say that there's only a one-stop shop application, that's because we're evaluating you for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness and the Temporary Expanded Public Service Loan Forgiveness programs. Now, just to, just to sort of recap, when we are discussing about finding out if you are part of your, your employer is an eligible employer, or even if your past employer is an eligible employer, when you get to the landing page, you're going to see on your, as you see on your screen, you're going to be able to start to see whether or not your employer is eligible. But again, you're going to need the employment employer identification number in order to fi find out if they are eligible or not. Now, when you go through that process, you may see a certain number of agencies or offices that are using that EI num and number. So you want to make sure you want to pick the one that's closest identifies with your employer. Now, if you if you if you're part of an organization that has a third party really doing the W twos, the payroll, then in the, that it, that's not going to be the EIN that you're going to use. If you're just going to ask them for the EIN number of your current employer, not the contracting employer, the current employer that you are that you're employed under. As it relates to that, a, a simple way of getting access to the help tool, you simply visit studentaid.gov forward slash PSLF. And again, you're going to need your FSA login as well as your EIN number or your most recent W-2. There are five sections to the help tool. Number one, we just talked about the employment history. You're going to have to complete one EC or employment certification, employee certification for each employer that you were employed at for when you want to get credit for. So if you have been in repayment for the last 14 years, you work for three different employers during that time, you're going to need to complete three different employer certifications and send it off to the employer. We do provide loan tips as well as information as it pertains to the application itself, letting you know exactly what the process is from there. And then you wanna confirm that we have the right personal information on file, such as your address, email address, first name, last name, et cetera. And then finally, you should review and save. And then once you, once you save it, it's gonna allow you the opportunity to, to either print or save to your desktop so you can break out the information necessary to submit you to, to the different employees and eventually to the loan servicer. Now, a couple of things about, about service members. If you can't get the EC completed from your employer or your, 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 your branch, then keep this in mind, you can simply attach DD-214 to the application, which will which let us know when you were deployed, when you returned and so forth during that particular time. And then you have you attach that to your, your, your application 
and you can go ahead and send it into Mohila if they're your servicer or two, or you can fax it into us and or mail it into us in lieu of the EC. Now, when you go through the process and you're able to complete the confirmation page is where you're gonna be able to download the PSLF application form. And that application form is what you're gonna to have to submit. Again, part of the application form is gonna have your personal information on there, as well as your EC or your employer certification. All this is, is, is gonna be part of the package. And again, you can upload it to Mohila or you can send it in by mail and or by fax. Now, at the end of the package, we're gonna ask you to sign. The only signatures that we do accept is if you're hand drawing it or you're using your mouth to sign it. If you have a scanned photo of a, a signature that was hand drawn, or is it basically, again, that was a wet signature that you applied to it. We don't accept the cursive font that comes preloaded with certain databases and software, and we don't accept the digital certificate based signatures as well. So we only accept the hand, handwritten or the mouse, the, the, the copy, uh, copy of a handwritten scanned uh, uh, signature or a wet signature. Those are the only three that we do have. And again, if Mohila is not your servicer, on the right side of your screen or for the left for several other individuals, you'll see the exact address that you can send the information off to. And if you would like to fax it, please feel free to fax it at 866-222-7060. Once again, that, that, that fax, fax number is 866-222-7060. Now let's start and running through some scenarios that some of you may have heard, and we're gonna run through some myths on several, several, several uh, myths that you may have heard that are really incorrect. So we wanted to hope, hopefully clear that up. So first scenario, Carmen has been employed with a nonprofit center for 10 years. However, she was in default a few times due to personal circumstances and was only able to make partial payments. She believes she's close to 120, but worried she isn't eligible. Are there any recommendations? Well, first and foremost, it was good that she was out there. She was employed with a nonprofit center that may be eligible for over 10 years. So she, had, she may have 10 years of qualifying payments, but she was in default a few times due to personal circumstances, which can happen. However, those payments will not be counted toward public service loan forgiveness, even if they were in partial payments because she was in default. Now, what she should do is put forth the application and there's gonna be two check boxes on the application form. Number one, you wanna be evaluated for the payment count. And number two, you wanna be evaluated for the public service loan forgiveness. Now they're both part of the program. One is just looking to say, hey, look, I think I made 100 in the payments. I wanna be evaluated for those 120 payments. And therefore, and I wanna be considered eligible if in fact that I've, I am considered that I made 120 payments. Now, on the other side, an uh, individual may just say, I just want a payment count. So just update my payment count, and that's all I want. And those are the distinct differences between the two. So in this case, she's going to check the first box, which is I want a payment count, because she wants to see exactly if she was, in fact, part, you know, close to the 120. If, in fact, she was deemed that she made 120 qualifying payments, then what, what, what the service is going to do is automatically move her over into the evaluation for it to have the, to have the rest of the loans forgiven at that point. The second scenario, Jermaine has been in the field for over 125 years. And no, not, excuse me, let me back up. Not over 125 <laughs> as a dedicated employee right there and a healthy one at that. Jermaine has been in the field for over 25 years. He started paying back loans back in 2004. He is sure he made over 120 payments by now. Do all of his payments count? Now, it, it really de depends on the field that he was in for all for those 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 25 years. Even while he was making pay loans, making payments on loans back in 2004. So what he has to do is just like Carmen in the, in the previous scenario, he's going to have to submit the application just to get a payment count. Now, he can submit it to be evaluated for the public service loan forgiveness program. That's perfectly fine. But in this case, we don't know the kind of field that he was in or the industry that he was in, because he could, if he's in a private sector working for a private company, he may not be eligible under that particular uh, circumstance. So it's important that he first finds out if his employer is an eligible employer. And if that is an eligible employer, then he wants to make sure he pushed forth for or check the box to be evaluated for the public service loan forgiveness program. Next scenario. 
Alexis started working with, with, with two part-time positions. One 15 hours as a government contract and the other 15 hours with a profit, a private for-profit company. She began, she then began working full-time for a school for two years and is now full-time with the local nonprofit for the last three years. She knows she still has payments to go, but should she complete the PSLF form and how many payments will count? Well, first let's break that down, okay? When we say full-time, we mean 30 hours or more or as designated by your employer, if they say, well, you have to work 40 hours here, this person worked 35, then that person needs an additional um, five, five hours to be considered full-time, quote unquote. Now, the first thing is that one 15 hours of government contractor, which is good, but the other 15 hours for a private for-profit company is not good. So therefore she doesn't have enough qualifying hours. Now, when she starts working full-time for a school for two years, she has potentially 24 hours, I mean, 24 years of qualifying payments. But what supersedes that is that she was also working with us three years for an eligible nonprofit company full time. Now, that would actually, you know, instead of two years, she'll be evaluated for 36 months or three years. Now, even if she has payments to go, she still wants to submit us a PSLF form and with, with the completed uh, package to us so we can update her payment count because. What happens is that those 36 payments, if they were outside of the payment clause, then you add another 30 payments on top of that. She's then now she's at 64 payments already halfway through her public service loan forgiveness program. So keep that in mind as well. Now, a couple of myths that we do see out in the field a lot. Number one, Beth, who is an active duty service member, has made over 120 payments on each of her federal and private student loans, but not consecutively. When the news came out about a limited PSLF waiver, she decided not to apply because she heard that the payments needed to be consecutive. Was she correct? First and foremost, no, she was not correct because as I stated on the outset, you the payments do not need to be consecutive. They just need to add up to 120 while working for a qualifying employer, while, we're, while making payments on an eligible repayment plan under normal circumstances. But again, that's been expanded under the PSLF limited waiver. So in this case, she should apply. Now, what we already gonna know off the bat is that the private student loans, they don't count towards the public service loan forgiveness. So we're not going to consider that. But for the payments made on her federal student educational loans, we're gonna evaluate for, for that and see whether or not they add up to 120 qualifying payments. So in this particular uh, scenario or to Smith, she was not correct in regard to her thought process. Now, Pat tried to apply for the PSLF program five years ago and was told that she was ineligible to do so because her federal loans were not a direct loan. When she heard about the limited PSLF waiver, she decided not to apply. Was she correct? In this particular scenario, no, again, because before the payment clause, before the limited waiver was enacted, she was, she was evaluated under normal PSLF requirements. And quite frankly, with under this particular scenario, um, she wouldn't have been uh, eligible. However, there is a limited waiver going on right now that concludes on October 31st, 2022. So before when she was told that, she, that her federal loans, which could have been the federal family educational loans or the Perkins loan, were not eligible. Now is the time that she wants to consolidate her loans into a direct loan program, reapply to make sure she gets evaluated for those payments that were made previously on her federal loan and or her, her, her Perkins loan to get credit for those. So in order for her to do so, she needs to put forth the PSLF application, be evaluated for the payment count, have her payment count updated, and or quite possibly moved over to eligibility for the public service loan forgiveness program. So in this particular case, she was not correct. And with the next steps that she should be doing is completion of the PSLF application forms and get it into us as soon as possible. The second to last myths, now, Jeff has heard from people in online forums that his federal loans, if his federal loans are were forgiven, that he would have to pay taxes on the forgiven amount. Jeff has been paycheck to paycheck as a teacher in his local school system for the last 13 years. He loves his career, but is worried that it would create a financial burden for him. Is he correct? Well, technically he's correct and he's not correct. Now, when he's not correct, he's that not gonna create a financial burden for him in terms of federal income tax because the 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 tax the, the forgiven amount is not considered taxable income, okay? That's for federal income taxes. Now for for the state, 
it may apply on the, on, the, on the opposite where it is counted as taxable income. He would just have to talk to a tax accountant about what best fits his scenario. But on a federal level, the forgiven amount is not considered taxable income. Last but not least, three years ago, Manuel retired after 30 years as an educator at a local elementary school. He has made 20, 120 payments on his federal direct student loans, but not think that he should apply because he's not currently employed at his former school, his employer. Is he correct? Now, Manuel is not correct in this particular situation because of limited waiver. Now, again, under normal PSLF requirements, at the time of application or at the time of receiving forgiveness for your loans, you have to be working for the eligible employer. In this scenario, under these uh, circumstances of the limited PSLF waiver, you don't have to currently be working for an eligible employer to get credit for past payments or be considered for forgiveness. So in his case, he should put forth the application. He should be evaluated for eligibility for the public service loan forgiveness program. Because in that case, he might be considered to have the remaining of his loans forgiven. So the only way he can do that is putting forth that PSLF application on or before October 31st of 2022. Now, as you're navigating this process, we do have tools and resources that can help. Number one, we do have a landing page with more information as it pertains to the PSLF limited waiver. You can visit the studentaid.gov forward slash PSLF waiver to get more information as it pertains to FAQs and as well as information about how to contact your loan servicer. And especially if your loan service is Mohila, their information is to your right-hand side where you can give them a contact at 418-866-4352. Once again, to contact them toll-free, their number is 1-888-866-4352. And if you need to fax them from information, that number is 866-222-7060. Once again, it's 866-222-7060. And their address is on your screen if you if you need to send them information via regular mail. We are on social media, so please like and follow all of our social media pl our platforms. We are posting consistently posting information as it pertains to PSLF limited waiver, as well as updated information as it pertains to the FAFSA form for many of you that are not only just here to listen to the information as it pertains to public service loan forgiveness, but some of you may be parents college access professionals, teachers of students who are getting ready to go through the process of the FAFSA for the first time. And we do have abundance of information as it pertains to both programs. And in addition to the temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness program as well. With that said, I'm gonna turn it back over to the Congressman's office to facilitate the answer, questions and answers portion of this webinar. Isaiah, thank you so much for all the wonderful information. Um, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A, um, but I already have one question that came up. So it reads, what if I'm in the process of consol consolidating my loans? Can I still submit for the waiver? Yes, you technically can. So we are expecting that individuals will be sort of in that gray area. So when you're in the process of consolidating your loans within the last two weeks of the month, then just put in the, the PSLF limited waiver application just to get it on file because the loan servicer will be able to see that you're in the process of consolidating. Once that process has been completed, then they're gonna move you over to the for the evaluation phase. So yes, you can submit the application while you're currently in the process of being of consolidating your federal student educational loans. Perfect. Um, I have one other question. What if my employer is not listed on the website, but they are a nonprofit? Awesome. So what you can do is when you when you go through the process and you enter in the EIN number, it says this person is employer is not found. You can manually actually add you manually add to the employer. At that point, when you manually add the employer, you still submit it as if you're submitting the employer employer certification form because you're gonna we're gonna pre print and print everything on there. What we're gonna do is evaluate that employer. We're gonna review them. And if they are deemed to be a nonprofit organization, we're gonna update the help tool to reflect their eligibility. Perfect. And then during that time, can I still submit my waiver while it's being processed? 
Absolutely. The only thing that's going to happen is that when you submit that waiver, even if, if, if an employer is being evaluated at that time, your application is just going to be on hold until we have either approved or deny the request update. Great. Thank you. And then um, last question, but are there any resources uh, where I can check if my state is taxing these payments? We would always advise checking your, your state's um, financial aid, um, excuse me, your state's financial institution, your comptroller's office to find out more information about whether or not the forgive, given amount is considered taxable income. And those are the key words you want to listen, you want to hear in it. The given amount, is it considered taxable income? Thank you. Um, Isaiah, thank you so much for joining us this morning and giving the presentation on the public service loan forgiveness waiver. We hope that uh, everyone in our district who is able to apply and qualifies can apply before the deadline. Um, and then if you can just remind us once more when the deadline is. Sure. The deadline is October 31st of 2022, 27 days from now. Yes, so please remember the deadline is coming up. Uh, submit your waiver form. And Isaiah, thank you once more uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope you have a wonderful morning and the rest of your day and that this information was useful to you all. Thank you. Bye.